My name is Brian Gifford. I'm the research director with the Integrated Benefits Institute. And today I'm presenting an evolving modeling approach to the lost work time impact of people who contract COVID-19. Uh, I'm gonna start by, by introducing uh, the original national level model that IBI produced in April, 2020. And I'm gonna discuss some of the ways that we've adapted that model to account for the geographic dispersion of, of COVID-19 cases. Okay, and then I'm gonna take us into a demonstration of the online interactive map. So before we go too far, a little bit about the Integrated Benefits Institute or IBI as it's commonly known. We are a national nonprofit research and educational organization focused on workforce health and productivity. We have a core message, it's that everyone knows that illness has cost. We use research and analytics to help business leaders understand how health and a healthy workforce actually creates value. Now the usual approach focuses on how health and illness influence employees' abilities to contribute to business objectives, typically in the form of uh, how healthy or healthy high-performing people are more frequently on the job, feeling well, putting in good work, doing all the things that actually make a company a company, selling the things a company makes, making the things a company sells. That is the usual context for which we discuss health and productivity. And today's discussion occurs within a different context when the economic impact of a public health crisis is almost beyond comprehension. We're looking at a very small fraction of the economic damage and looking at the losses for different stakeholders including disability carriers, state disability programs, employers, and of course, employees who contract COVID-19. A little bit about the prior study that IBI published in April. Uh, all we really did was take different scenarios that Covered California was using to model healthcare costs for coronavirus cases. And then we did some back of the envelope calculations of paid sick time and disability leave costs. So starting with their low, mid, and high projections of confirmed cases, for example, at the low end, uh, figuring about 4 million cases, uh, by our estimation, we expected that about 1.5 million of those cases would be for employees, and that when you take into account sick day pay, disability wages, benefits, the cost would be about 6.1 billion. At the other end, at the, at the high range of projections, uh, 15 million cases in the U.S., 5.6 are, uh, we estimated would be employees, total cost of $23.3 billion. Okay. Now, the good news, as I hope everybody is well aware, is that the low end estimate of 4 million cases has been pushed back considerably from the time we first wrote it, or first wrote the article, um, by actions taken to slow the spread probably shelter in place and physical distancing, maybe testing and contract tracing, but that would be much more recently. So for example, when we originally uh, started doing the analysis for this study, right after the shelter in place orders in the six Bay Area counties uh, took effect around St. Patrick's Day, uh, we were projecting about 4 million cases by early April. And that's because at the time, the number of cases, number of confirmed cases, uh, in the U.S. we're doubling every two days for that first week of our lockdown. Uh, a week later, they were doubling every four days. So the, the rate of growth had slowed until through the most, or, or some of the most current data um, from May 13 to May 19, cases are doubling every 45 days. And at this rate, we would not hit 4 million cases uh, until late July and of course, that assumes that the current growth rate of one or two percent a day still holds. Okay. So knowing that we have moved the needle on the number of cases, even going towards the low range estimate, um, we can now invoke, invoke the famous box dictum. Um, essentially, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I am sure that Professor Box was not trying to absolve modelers of our errors. Uh, instead, these words are really a reminder that our knowledge is contingent and should be revised in light of new facts. That's going to be true for modeling as in science more generally. So I've showed you some of the new facts um, that the virus, the spread of the virus has slowed considerably. Okay. 
So what we really want to do then, taking Professor Box's words to heart, is if we're going to revise the model, we want to do it, of course, in ways that make it more useful, not in ways that just double down on the way that we did it before. And so one of the ways we wanted to do, um, if the original model was really an organizing principle, a way to think about COVID's work loss burden, um, what we wanted to do was go a little bit more from the general to the specific. So again, what are the facts on the ground that we understand a little bit better? Well, one is we understand the geographic dispersion of cases. So for example, uh, one in five cases, probably more like one in seven cases have been in New York County, okay, where Manhattan is. So we know we've seen how the, the coronavirus cases have been concentrated on the Eastern seaboard, especially around the mid-Atlantic states. So any estimation based on the national average, we know right there is going to be off. But we also know how we can correct that because we do have sources of data um, on wages, on industry representation, which is a way that we understand what's the likelihood that somebody had, for example, short-term disability benefits through their employer, um, whether or not they happen to be an employee at all. This is all varies by, uh, by geographic region in the US. And so to get a better sense of what is going on at the county level, where we can actually start to count the confirmed coronavirus cases, we went to nationally representative data. And in this case, we used uh, the Census Bureau's American Community Survey. Okay. Now, the reason we use this survey is it is actually pretty large. It's very well represented of the United States. It's about 3 million cases in 2018, or 3 million survey respondents. Um, and it has information at the county level. And when we are not able to get information about individuals at the county level, we can sometimes, in most cases, uh, know about the metropolitan statistical area, actually their core-based statistical area, um, if they happen to live in one of those core-based areas, and of course we know their state. So if we're looking at ways to understand how we can think about the likelihood that somebody's employed, their wages, and their benefits level, this is a really good approximation uh, with these data. Okay. We're also able to do something we couldn't do the first time around, which is Think about uh, state uh, uh, SDI systems, right? Short-term disability insurance in California, New Jersey, and New York, um, but also in Rhode Island and Hawaii, okay? So we're able to take a much more granular level of information uh, about uh, some of our underlying assumptions and apply them to county-level COVID-19 cases, which we get from the Johns Hopkins University. Okay. And just to give you a sense of how the original model differs from the updated model, again, we're going to be really interested in how things are going uh, county by county, state by state, metro by metro, region by region. Um, but just in the overall, uh, here's, how, here's how the new model would differ and does differ from the original model. So when we looked at the original model of confirmed cases, we were estimating based on the Bureau of Labor Statistics surveys that about 38% of cases would be for employees, people who had a job at the time that they contracted COVID-19. Um, the new model looking at the county level, taking into, into account where the cases are actually occurring, uh, we would estimate that employees are gonna make up about 45% of the, of the cases. Uh, again, the employees who would be eligible for short-term disability is about 38% national average, but just given where the coronavirus cases are, are appearing throughout the United States, our model would put that at about 52%. So you can start to see where the cost assumptions um, overall, or for every thousand cases, every million cases, um, the re refined model actually makes things uh, costlier just in terms of the number of cases. Okay. Again, we've also been able to model how many employees are eligible for state SDI systems. In this case, it's California and New York. Um, by my understanding, uh, New Jersey, Rhode Island, Hawaii, these are much closer in the way they function to, uh, to employer-based health insurance just with many, many more people enrolled. We see wages are higher from $200 per day uh, in the original model to $256 a day in the, the new model. 
short-term disability wage rates, wage replacement rates, or actually the wages go up um, because the average wage goes up. There's a California SDI wage and a New York SDI wage, which is paid to people. It's actually a state maximum. Um, this does not include any of the wraparound payments that private employers can offer to their employees. Um, but again, this really will just give you a sense of if you go back to the original paper, and I, I encourage everybody to do that because all the other assumptions, all the other modeling approach is the same, except now instead of applying our models to humans, um, this is where they're really going to differ. And this is really what's going to drive different results. Okay. Now, having said that, why don't we take a look at the map itself? Okay, and here we are. Um, every one of these, uh, every one of these orange points on the map of the United States um, is a U.S. county where we've had at least one confirmed coronavirus case. And if you've been paying attention to how the cases have been actually occurring, it's not going to be surprised that one is they tend to be concentrated in some of the larger population areas. So over here on the eastern seaboard, for example, we can we will find that. As of May 20, uh, New York County, Manhattan, had 194,000 confirmed, 194,550 confirmed cases, of which we would estimate about 94,914. I know that's a very, it seems like a very precise estimate, um, are going to be for employees. So generally speaking, the larger the bubble on the map, <clears throat> the larger the bubble on the map, uh, the more confirmed cases, and the deeper the color red, from orange to red, the higher number of, of uh, employed cases, okay? Large bubbles, confirmed cases, deep red, uh, more employee cases. And the reason we're gonna see more employee cases, um, for example, it's not just a factor of the size, um, but it's also we see different rates of employment, okay? And we can take you a little bit deeper into that. Now. As a map, it's somewhat hard to read if we plot every county because at this point, we're almost plotting every county in the United States. So just visually, if we want to present it a different way, we can trim it down, for example. Only show me counties with at least 50 cases. Okay, and this will give us a better sense of where we would tend to see big outbreak areas. So look at California, for example. And in fact, we can start filtering states. Why don't we do it that way? So we'll take a deeper look at California. The population center of Los Angeles is, is the largest in California, the second largest city in the US. Um, and so we're looking at about almost 41,000 cases, about 17,000 for employees. Large population centers in Northern California, uh, San Francisco County, Alameda County, uh, Contra Costa County, they cover probably the same geographic area, but you would have to start combining all of these just to get the similar amount of cases. So the story here, of course, and, and this is not gonna be new to people who've been paying attention, is it's not just about population density, it's about lots of other different factors. Okay, it's really about where we tended to see hotspots. So we can break it down in that respect. We can start to develop regions and where I'm located out here in Oakland, regions make a little bit less sense than they do uh, out on the East Coast, perhaps. So we'll start building what has been the epicenter, New Jersey, New York. Uh, we'll throw in, for example, Pennsylvania and Connecticut as well. Okay, And we start to get a sense that even when we're trimming it down to about 50, we're seeing lots of cases popping up throughout the region, but of course they really do seem to be centralized right around here, uh, around Manhattan, around New York, uh, Hudson County, Nassau County, and so on. Okay, so we're starting to 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 get a better sense, or or to really zero in on where we expect to see more and more of the cases. And of course, if we're starting to talk about more and more cases, we're going to start talking about more and more costs. Okay. So if we limit it down just to this to this region that I focused on, the mid-Atlantic states, we're looking at about 612,000 cases, about 284,000, 285,000 are going to be for employees. Uh, based on our modeling, we're expecting that about uh, 195,000 are gonna be eligible for short-term disability. 
we also see that that New York actually are also or is the only state that has in this respect state SDI cases and we would count a case as state SDI we would look at the industry that people the industries that people work in uh, weight the employer-based short-term disability uh, eligibility and participation um, by those industries and then use the rest to estimate those people who work in or, or the proportion of people who are working in the the lower industries or the or the the industries that are less likely to offer employer-based benefits we assume they do in fact participate in the state sdi program okay and from here we really just start applying some wage replacements um, that we get from the bls um, to their to the average daily wages in the original document based on what we could see is the distribution of hospitalization COVID cases, um, ICU COVID cases, and cases that didn't require hospitalization, we were able to take information from IBI's uh, short-term disability benchmarking system and figure that each COVID-19 case was actually, including the elimination period, going to be about 20 days long. Okay, so we're able to divide up the lost work days by how many days would have been paid on average uh, by a disability system, by paid sick days and by state SDI payments. But also we understand that there are still going to be people, even in New York, uh, even in New Jersey, even in California, who are not going to be eligible for disability. So there are going to be some unpaid days, even in states where generally people tend to have paid sick days. We also assume that whether or not a person is paid sick days, all of the employee benefits that employers pay, and that includes social security contributions, Medicare contributions, um, all of that is going to continue. So for example, life insurance um, premiums, workers' comp premiums, healthcare benefits, all of that goes on whether or not people are actually gonna be work. I guess the exception would be the social security and Medicare. If people aren't getting paid, there aren't gonna be contributions, but everything else, disability premiums, um, that is all going to be paid day in, day out. So we're gonna separate benefits paid by, from sick day payments, okay? So we can start thinking about these as the disability, the disability insurers as the stakeholders. And that would include self-insured employers as well, of course. State disability systems are our second set of stakeholders. The employers who pay sick days and benefits are a third set of stakeholders. Um, and so for these four states, we would expect to see about $1.8 billion in total payments. Okay. Now there's another set of stakeholders, that's the employees themselves who contract COVID-19. Um, and given the difference between normal wages and average social or short-term disability wages and those proportion of days that are not paid at all, we expect that employees who contract uh, COVID-19 collectively are missing from these four states, they're losing out on about uh, $809 million in wages collectively, so almost a billion dollars. Okay, and that's a real quick overview of the modeling itself. If we look for the entire United States, we can start getting a, a really good picture of, of what is, is going on across all the different states. So these are all sorted by the total payments. So we have about uh, one and a half million as of yesterday, May 20, one and a half million confirmed cases, about 699,000 would be for employers. The employer-based short-term disability system is going to process, in this case, up through yesterday, cumulatively, 368,000 cases, state SDI systems for New York and California gonna process another 113,000. And we just keep looking at the the, the different stakeholders' uh, losses in this case, 817,000 for employer-based disability, 110, oh, excuse me, 817 million for employer-based disability policies, uh, 110 million for state SDI. Sick day payments are going to be about a billion. And the benefits paid by employers are about 1.6 billion brings us to about 3.6 billion for the first million and a half cases, okay? And of course, employees themselves 
in terms of the wages they're losing if they have COVID-19. This does not factor in people who have lost their jobs because of COVID-19, people who are staying home and taking care of, of, uh, a, of a sick relative, um, children who have, I guess, been furloughed from school. Employees themselves are losing about 1.5 billion so far. Okay. And we've ordered these according to the to the pay, according to the payments, and of course the number of cases are largely shaking out into the same way as the number of uh, in the same order as the, as the number of cases. Okay, but it's not necessarily the case. So if we look at Illinois, more cases, more employed cases, where we start to see some of their payments are are coming up a little shorter is just given the industry base, just given the wage base. Um, how that gets mixed in, this is where we start to see some of the losses are a little bit less than we would predict based just on, on confirmed cases, okay? Now, finally, since these data come from Johns Hopkins University at the county level, we have also organized these results into counties by metropolitan statistical area. So again, if we look at this metropolitan area that includes New York City, uh, Newark, New Jersey City, um, we start to see where a lot of the cases are, uh, or how they're distributed. And so New York County, which includes um, Manhattan, uh, 194,000 cases, the next highest county in this metropolitan area is Westchester. The third is Hudson in New Jersey. Okay. So we can start to figure out county by county um, what are going to be the losses for these different kinds of stakeholders. And again, we can start to filter out different kinds of states or different states that we are less interested. I'm going to stick with New York and the New York metropolitan area. So, but if we're concerned mostly about New York and New Jersey, for example, then we'll just take out all, any, any county such as Pike County in Pennsylvania that actually contributes to the count for the metropolitan area. Okay. Within single states out west, Metropolitan areas typically don't overlap as much in states. Um, if so, again, if we look at California, right? Far and away, the Los, Los Angeles County and Orange County um, collectively are accounting for many, many more cases than almost anywhere else. We look at the counties that make up the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, it's only about uh, 8,000 county, or excuse me, 8,000 confirmed cases, about 4,000 employee cases, okay? Now, when you start adding all of these counties together, this area population-wise is probably about as large as Los Angeles County. Um, so again, it really drives home the fact of it's taking a national look at things and just applying these averages is not really the way to go. Um, and that a model that actually gets down to uh, better information about where the cases are actually occurring is going to be much more powerful if, for example, we're looking for ways to figure out what would be the costs of a second wave of cases be? What would be the costs of uh, if one of these counties, for example, held steady but never really turned its growth rate to zero? Okay, we, can start do, we can start doing that at a much, more, much higher level of precision than we could have before. Okay. Now, I wanna leave you with this. Um, this is a better model than it was. It's still not as good as it could be. Um, one of the first slides I showed you was about IBI. Uh, IBI is a very small organization, but we are the hub of a network of experts who know much more about the disability system and know much more about the different rules and regulations in different places than we know. We would like to continue to refine this model um, and hopefully we'll be doing so without many, many more confirmed cases of coronavirus. But we would like to refine this model in terms of what do we know about uh, different policies that states have? Um, what do we know about different wage replacement rates for industries? We're looking for ways to make this better. We're looking for ways to make this more useful out in the field that we are still calling health and productivity, but out in the field of, uh, for example, employee benefits and for policymakers generally. So any, any uh, suggestions you might have 
for helping us improve this model. Um, please send them to me, bgifford at ibiweb.org. Um, we hope to, again, we hope to keep revising this, keep improving it, so that at some point we'll be able to take findings such as these and make it a more general method so that hopefully we're not talking about coronavirus next time. We can talk about other kinds of issues, other kinds of public health crises. Um, hopefully there'll be few, but we know there'll be some, and we wanna be able to uh, provide some better information to the conversation. Thank you very much, I appreciate your time.